Hey, everyone. Thanks for tuning in to another episode of eDiscovery After Hours. My guest this week is Lynn Tubalino from Dykema. We cover a lot of topics, but chief among them would be eDiscovery and, of course, Taylor Swift's Eras Tour. So you don't want to miss it. Sponsor this week is Proteus Discovery Group. If you need data collected, hosted in Relativity One, Reveal, or Everlaw, or a managed document review, check out ProteusDiscovery.com. You don't know how to drink your whole generation. Drinks on the house. Yes, sir. Now, wait a second. Drinks are 50% off. Right. Now, wait a second. Double the price of everything. And I work only 16 hours a day. A union man only works eight hours a day. I belong to two unions. And now, e-discovery after hours with your host, Ryan Short. All right, Lynn, welcome to e-discovery after hours. Cheers. Uh, cheers, cheers to you. I don't know if you could see, oh, you can see the nutritional information. Yeah, there you go. Ma the mango is my favorite. The mango? Cheers. The mango. We're working on white claws tonight. I love that. Can't um, go wrong with it. My, I'm a black cherry guy. I just bought a six pack of oh. black cherry for this. See, if we got the variety pack, I would yeah. give you all the black cherries because I've had them a couple times and I'm usually like, can't do it. I can't do citrus, like anything like uh, like in drink form or anything else. I think I'm just too Irish and there's no citrus in Ireland. And, you know, it's just like, that's been, what does that mean? It's just been passed down through generations. Even orange juice is a struggle unless there's, you know, champagne in it or something. I was like going to say, what about mimosas? Like, can you have a mimosa with a drop of orange juice? Like, are you I at can, that level? I can do that. That that's okay. okay. That that passes the palate test. So, but yeah, but no, this is a this is a solid choice. I still remember I had never heard of white claws, and then uh, an employee sent me a video, something in, like entitled "There are no laws when you're drinking claws," and I'd never heard of it, but I went and got a six pack that night. They they sold me. I mean, so I did not hear of white claw until I moved to the suburbs. So now it's my official summer mom, suburban mom drink. Yeah. Uh, all right. Well, I want to get to the suburbs in your city life and all of your past lives. Uh, but okay. first, let's 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 do a little get to know you for for the audience. You you cool with a little lightning round here? Oh my goodness! Yes, I hope I'm prepared. I'm very nervous now. <laughs> it's gonna be fun. I love that you're not prepared. That's the fun of it. Okay. First concert. Oh, oh my gosh! I doubt anybody will know this, but my first official concert was DC Talk, which was a Christian yeah. rock band. And then I saw them at Moody Bible Institute. Nice. <laughs> right there on Chicago Avenue. Yes. Yes. Oh, my gosh. If any of the listeners know who DC Talk is, I commend you. <laughs> <laughs> well, what's his face? The singer, because it was like a rapper and a singer. In yeah, two, there was three of them, right? Okay. Oh, wait, you know who DC Talk is? I do, yes. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so I commend you. Yes, yeah. there was a rapper and then two singers. Okay, and one of them is still making music. And he had like a really sad situation where his son passed away just a couple of years ago. Oh my gosh. This, yeah, like super beautiful song afterwards about it. It was really touching, honestly. It was a bit of a tearjerker. So. Okay, well, I'm going to have to look that up now because I yeah. did not follow them. Clearly, <laughs> uh, you know, I would. So that was like the the middle school, high school youth group. You know, they tried to play that to be like, you know, oh, we're hip, we're, we're cool. cool, yeah. yeah. Uh, but I actually do have a coworker who's like, I love Christian rap, and I'm like, I'm okay. So I, I'm I'm in the know. Oh, oh, okay. So I'm not anymore. <laughs> I was very heavily involved in church and why, <laughs> like youth group, everything, and so that yeah. was that's why it yeah. was my first concert. I love it. All right. So that was your first concert. What was your favorite concert? Oh, my God. Okay. So I walked into this concert not thinking anything. Like, I loved this artist. I like liked their songs, but I was not like, let me just, you know, go to their concert. My friend happened to tickets. My daughter loves this person. And I said, okay, let's do it. This is like core memory activation for my daughter, Taylor Swift. Left okay. Era's tour. You yes. did. I did see Taylor Swift. 
Okay. In Kansas City. So of course now I'm like, oh my God, what's happening? Travis Kelsey was there when he sh- sh- when he like made his move on her. So I don't know. I don't know. I was there at the concert where Taylor Lautner and Joey King were there. And yes. I lost my mind. I think I cried like a child when Taylor Lautner came out and my daughter was looking at me like, who is this grown man that you're crying at? <laughs> and, and I said, I have done a disservice to you. We are going to watch Twilight in a couple of years when you're a little bit older. <laughs> yeah, a little older for sure. Yeah. Um, you know, what's funny is uh, I recently heard, uh, I've listened to Conan O'Brien Needs a Friend, the comedy podcast. And okay. is it, what, what's the actress? Is it Kristen Stewart? That's her name. Yes. Yes. She was, she was just on. She was very funny. She was only 17 when they started filming those movies. I there, So there are certain actors that I kind of feel like always look the same age and she's mm-hmm. one of them like I always perpetually think she's in her late 20s early 30s like I just can't I don't get it so yes that's, that's just yeah so uh what did you let's pause let's pause on Taylor for a minute so what did you think <laughs> had you listened to her previously was eras worth the hype Let, let's get the lay of the land here okay so like I said I liked her songs, but I wasn't like, let me follow her. Let me like, I was just like, all right, she puts out a good beat. We're good. You know, women empowerment. Yes. I am not even kidding you. My friend who got the tickets, we drove to Kansas City and listened to, she had a playlist on Spotify Uh that she created with all the heiress to her song. And it just so happened that midnight before the concert she released okay. now taylor's version it was a whole thing I yeah remember. so i was not before that i was like all right i'll listen to her songs like but i'm not like you know into it sure i have thus i've since then changed my stance on taylor swift i i applaud her as an artist and more so as like a female role model to a bunch of children around the world and yes it is worth the hype like I am very my very first job out of college was um at a microphone and audio electronics company so I was around a lot of great artists people who were singing and it was great it was just the time of my life there and then to see somebody literally like take like a an entire catalog of theirs right and just create this amazing show and like just the production value, everything. Okay, I know I'm gonna sound like a crazy fan right now, but I just, I just really valued it all. And then I started on the way back home, I started doing a deep dive because I'd heard about kind of like what the Taylor's version or TV as the Swifties like to call, like what it was all about. But I started doing the deep dive and there are some ties to e-discovery. Uh, there are for sure. <laughs> so I literally was like, in the car kind of went on the deep dive of the scooter broad whole situation and i was trying to explain to my friend who is not in the e-discovery world as our children are sitting in the back seat on their ipads and i was just geeking out over it and she just looked at me like i was insane but i was like you know what i found my i found my way yeah that's right that's right it doesn't matter how you get there um yeah gosh, that's so funny all right you alluded to the next question which is the most famous celebrity you've met okay well um i've met uh, i've met three <laughs> celebrities i've met okay i'll tell you all of them yeah fred armison okay at corner bakery downtown chicago <laughs> so it's so crazy i was went out to lunch with a friend of mine from law school and we heard a very distinct voice. And I'm like, that sounds like that guy from SNL. And it, lo and behold, it was him. <laughs> so I, I wish I had a Fred Armisen impression because, oh, man, maybe I'll have, I don't know what the licensing laws are. Maybe I'll have my editing guy drop something in right now. Brooklyn's tough, but the Bronx, the Bronx is in the lungs. What? The Bronx. Brooklyn. The Bronx. Brooklyn. Manhattan. Manhattan. It was, and I, because we both kind of looked at each other, and we're like, we, we know, I know, I know that voice. Yeah. I know that voice. The next person I met, my sister lives in LA, and we were, right, it was right before COVID hit, we were going to her son's birthday party, which was at Bolero, which is a bowling alley place that's fancy, and lo and behold, my 
son was obsessed with Olaf at the time, we literally ran right into Josh Gad. But no I, he way. was on the phone and I was like, he was like, and I was like, okay, I'm not disturbing you. I'm not going to be that person. Like you're probably here hanging out with either your family or friends, like not going to. Yeah. So I was like, oh my God. so yes. yes. Um, and then not as famous, but TikTok famous uh, during legal week last year, I ran into Chris Olson on the street. I don't know if you know who that is, but I love him so much. So he's part Filipino and I love his like little TikTok videos with him and his grandma just so amazing and he was so gracious and nice and uh, I get pictures with Fred Armisen and Chris Olsen so yeah those are my celebrity uh, encounters that's pretty great um yeah so Fred Armisen would take the cake for me in that so he's a drummer I'm a drummer he has a special like a tongue-in-cheek special about like comedy for drummers and it is the goofiest thing like think about you getting excited about e-discovery on the way home from the Eras tour that's how we drummers feel about this this Fred Armisen special. Oh, like, oh you okay. just don't get it. <laughs> um, all right, I've never answered my own question, but I will hear because it dovetails in nicely. There you go. I've actually had lunch with Taylor Swift a few times. No, you have not. Yeah, I did. Uh, in the summer of 2009, I was an unpaid intern at Big Machine Records <gasps> in Nashville, Tennessee. <sighs> And um, so it was in this music row in Nashville. People, you know, they, they like if they saw the the ABC drama Nashville, you know, it's all depicted mm -hmm. in like these gleaming high rises, and it looks like a southern version of Wall Street, right? But music row is like a bunch of nineteen twenties and thirties homes that have been converted, and so right. it's in this little unmarked house. They didn't want paparazzi, and it was you know it was an independent operation, and um. So like some, even some of the artists didn't have the security code to get in the front door. And so, you know, you'd be up in, in the front room or two and you'd hear a knock and you'd open it. You never know who's on the other side. And uh, there had been this big hullabaloo. Remember, this is 15 years ago. And the way um, what was the number one hit was calculated was based on airplay. And you had all this data aggregated from across the country. And Taylor had recently released You Belong With Me. Oh my gosh. And there was like some serious data mining going on to validate that she had actually earned the number one spot. And so I hear this knock and I open the door and, you know, at the time, like 19 or 20 year old Taylor just <laughs> screams, go running down the hallway and behind her sheepishly in comes her mom. She just looks at me. She goes, I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> um, but Taylor was super nice. So I met her a couple of times that summer. And my experience, you mentioned, um, you know, working at uh, an audio electronics company and meeting some artists. My experience meeting artists, which I met quite a few that summer, was always, they were super nice. And whether they're putting on a face or not, I don't know. But yeah. I found almost to a fault, artists were so nice and down to earth and friendly. It was all their handlers and their business people who were all smug and arrogant. And I was like, nobody cares about you. <laughs> I think it's weird because their creative style, they, they they tap into their creative side, which we don't, yeah. you know, see a lot, right? Like in our yeah. society, it's just, no, you have to hide your emotions and they are able to kind of take that and appeal to the masses somehow. And yeah. it's just amazing. Yeah. All right, last uh, last lightning round here. You can see how slow the lightning round is. Uh, <laughs> <Stop. laughs> uh, most used app on your iPhone or your Android phone, whatever you have. Uh, we're an Apple household. I'm on my iPad right now. Okay. Um, TikTok and Duolingo. Oh, what are you what are you doing for Duolingo right now? Okay, so. I took Japanese when I was in college and I actually mm -hmm. got pretty fluent and my son um, had special needs. I think we've talked about this and mm -hmm. he always likes to, I feel like he has a mind for languages. So he was like, Hey mom, like learning Chinese, learning Russian by watching YouTube videos of his favorite books and remembering them. So he, I saw that I'm like, Oh, I need to go back and learn, relearn my Japanese and do that. And then he sees it. And so he listens in and then he's trying to convince me to 
learn Chinese now. <laughs> I'm like, I can't learn two languages at once. I, so kudos to you for doing that, for one. For two, I find tonal languages so intimidating. Like romance language, it's like, all right, these all have, these largely all have Latin roots, right? And it's like, yep. I, I can't, I can't debate religion and politics in Spanish, but like I can survive, right? I can get around. Uh, I don't even know if I could ask where the bathroom is in Chinese. You know what I mean? Like, it's just, and people say Chinese, and it's like, well, what does that mean? Like, which many, dialect <laughs> are spoken within those borders, right? Um, so, yeah. All right. Very cool. So, you mentioned uh, that this, that we are, we are enjoying your suburban mom drink, which I guess that yeah. makes me a suburban mom because I do quite enjoy but, these. Yes. By, <laughs> by extension, you are today. It's okay. That's right. Uh, okay. Your undergrad is from uh, a school in Chicago. Your law degree is from a school in Chicago. You work in Chicago. Where's home? Yes. Where'd, you, where'd you grow up? I grew up in Orland Park, Illinois. Orland Park. Ray grew up in Orland Park, Illinois. I know. We, he and I talked about this. Oh, well, there you go. All right. That's yeah. fun. Uh, and then was, so then you went to DePaul. Uh, yeah. Were you in Lincoln Park for a couple of years? So the only classes I took in Lincoln Park were my Japanese classes because mm. I was a business major. So everything was downtown for me. Okay. Gotcha. Yeah. So you had, I mean, you, you got into the legal space pretty early. So I don't, I wouldn't quite I say that you had like multiple acts, but you did not start in legal. Your undergrad is in business. And then you went and were working in some kind of a sales or marketing role. It escapes yeah. me at the moment. So what was your path? Was was law school or being in the legal space always the intention? Or did you get a business degree and then be like, business is terrible. I need to try something else. <laughs> yeah, so I would love that when it was the case. Um, it's a somewhat of a long story. So I had always said I wanted to go to law school. That was like me as a kid. I thought I was going to be the president of the United States because I always equated law school with being a president. Of course, who wouldn't at yeah. the time? Yeah. Uh, come from a... a family of immigrants who were both doctors, doctors of the U.S. So it was kind of the natural enemy <laughs> of who they wanted me to be. Um, so I ended up going to getting a business degree because my senior year of high school, um, I was 16 at the time, uh, my dad had a, a open heart surgery. So mm -hmm. and DePaul was the only school that I applied to in Illinois. And he also lived downtown. So I was like, all right, this is going to be it for me. Uh, and it makes sense for me if I ever want to open up my own practice one day. I don't know why I've had such like mature thoughts very young, but literally at 15, I was a, so I graduated high school at 16, younger, uh, started school pretty young. Um, and I just always had this foresight of, I want to get into the law field. I don't know where. I think if I want to open up my, pra I know my own practice one day, this is going to be good for me to have a business background. I wish it was. I hate the business side of things, but no, it was not that. And, and coincidentally, we my first job out of college because I waited a while to go to law school. Um, I basically was in that role in international sales because I thought I wanted to do something with the Japanese, didn't pan out. Um, and I got called for jury duty. And that's how I got back into the legal side, <laughs> I, I, which is most people hate jury duty. And I was like, what am I doing with my life? Why am I wasting my time? I need to get back into the law and just saw like the inner workings of the courtroom and just remembered how much I wanted to aspire to be in that, that industry. And so, yeah, it's funny. Yeah. Enough. Very cool. I love that. Um, all right. So you make it through, right. You're, you're in the business space, you transition into the paralegal world and then you head yep. back to law school. Was that, was that tough, right? When you've got almost a decade between one degree and going back to school, I found it intimidating. I was out of undergrad for maybe seven or eight years before I went back to my MBA. And I was still working full time and then going to school at night. And uh, man, it's a whole different mindset. Like, how did you how did you approach that transition? Was it hard to make the jump? Like, how, and how did you juggle everything? It was not hard for me. So... I, and I know what you're saying because I there were other students in my class kind of similarly situated where either second career or, you know, always had been a dream of theirs. 
it was not for me. And I'll tell you why. I was kind of insane when I was younger and always worked three jobs. And so I was always busy and never really had time for a life. So it was very, I did paralegal school before law school. So working full time paralegal school was actually like uh, in trial, had trials at my law firm and remembered like borrowing my boss's car to drive down back down so I could make my Thursday night class while we were at trial. Like, so there's, it was, I was always busy. And so yeah. for me, it was seamless. Like, and I always, I'm a lifelong learner. I don't know if I would ever get another degree at this point. I'm more focused on getting certifications right now, but I've always been like that. And so, yeah, I, it was not that hard for me because, and it was great because at the time I met my husband and he was traveling all week. So we never saw each other. So. <laughs> so you had plenty of time to study. Hit those books. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, man. That's too good. Um, all right. So then coming out of law school, was it your intention to practice? Or had you already, as a paralegal, been exposed to the list support and e-discovery side and knew that that was going to be the path? So I, uh, I mean, I've been a paralegal for a little bit. I found my mentor and kind of was like, oh, this is where the industry is going. Got into lit support, went to paralegal school, was still working in lit support. Then I thought, hmm, you know, it'd be nice if I had my JD because I could then talk to other attorneys and then I could say, oh, yes, I also have my JD. I don't know. Very expensive decision. However, I think had I not done that, like maybe I would have gotten a master's. It's just, it's led me to the path where I need to be, I think. So. Well, I find, I mean, it's, it, there was some kind of a hullabaloo the other day. I think that might be the second time in this podcast I've used the phrase hullabaloo, which is concerning. Great word. Great it's, word. It's, I'm only halfway into my first white claw, but that's a little <laughs> distressing. Um, I'll have to check my priorities tonight. Anyway, I, there was some kind of a kerfuffle, we'll just say, the other day about, uh, somebody petitioning to eliminate the phrase non-attorney or replace it. But I do find it to be true. Like as a non-attorney, you know, I there are pe people on our team who have a JD who have never practiced, but they just have a level of credibility that just I'll just never have, right? And others similarly situated will never have. So yeah, kudos to you for making that the uh, for making that expensive decision as you put it. <laughs> <laughs> but I like I like the phrase legal technologist because I feel like that's all encompassing regardless of what degree you may or may not have. And I think I think that's where the industry needs to kind of highlight, hey, this is why we're subject matter experts and can help yeah. you do what you need. Yeah, that's right. All right. Speaking of legal technology, um, right now nobody can open their inbox or their LinkedIn feed or anywhere else without seeing the phrase generative AI. And so if generative AI is being beat to death, what is being overlooked right now? Like what, are, what is something that is driving you or the, the attorneys that you support? What's driving you nuts or what's this unexpected expense? Like what's, what's not getting the attention? What's the dog that didn't bark as it were? So it's so crazy because I've been thinking about this and um, we're doing like I'm internally, I'm trying to do this big marketing push. And I just think it's back to basics, like communication, how to effectively manage your projects, right? I think some people are better at it than others. And so when I see those skills and I hone in on them and say, okay, what are you doing differently, right? Um, so yeah, I mean, I love that question so much because there's buzzwords in the industry, but that'll die down eventually. <laughs> And so hopefully people will just kind of go back to the basics of like putting yourself in that service mindset off, like figuring out what case teams might need and like really establishing that communication and that rapport with your case teams. How do you, did, have you found an effective way to try to systemize that within the practice of law, right? Within a law firm to say, hey guys, like I can save you time and money if you do X, Y, and Z for me. Do you have any use cases or any case studies where you're like, ah, success, and then you're able to? Like... I mean, I wouldn't call, I wouldn't. So it's so funny because I think about this, like, oh, why are you doing this work? And what what's the goal at the end of the day for you? Like, why would you take this on, right? Because something that I, I not really question about myself but my case case or my team is like, what are you doing, Glenn? Why are you taking on this request? But I think about it and I'm like, well, you just never know what people might say word of mouth carries so much more weight than any like use case scenario you can 
provide, right? Um, so when people see you doing the work and you get that positive feedback, you know they're hopefully telling somebody else right. in your firm and saying, oh, hey, so Lynn's team did this for me. It's probably not something they should have been doing, but hey, maybe we take a look at what they're offering, right? So I, I think building those personal relationships, even though the tasks may not be within your current wheelhouse, just stay humble and like help somebody out at the end of the day, right? So that's kind of where I'm at. I love that. But I, I, I would have never say that I knew every, and I know everything because I there's no magic, <laughs> magic white claw yeah. level, you know. If you find it, let's bottle it up and you can make a lot of money. <laughs> let's patent that bad boy. Let's go. That's right. <laughs> I can't think of a better note to end on than that. Lynn, cheers and thanks for joining me on the show. Cheers. Thank you, too.